So one of the most important difficulties facing ancient Egyptian is transportation. How can I transport such a big and heavy block of stone crossing the desert? It's impossible. So that's why they are very smart to build the temple. Not in the heart of the desert, it will be very difficult to reach, but not in the valley as well, because easily to be destroyed. Always something in between. And the whole temple should be connected to the river Nile. So they are dependent on water connection. Right? So that's why I'm going to start by the key. Can you see that? It is a remain of a platform or a pier. When the boats carrying stones, heavy objects, and then they are mooring back in here, and then unload everything they need as well for the build. Right? Then we're going to see ram headed strings, different kinds of strings. The body of a lion and the head of a ram. And the first element in any temple we have the first two huge towers. So we're going to see the two huge towers are unfinished. How how long it takes to build a temple? Two thousand years. Two thousand years. Some years better than the other. Some years slower than the other, but the building or construction never stops. Why? Because that was the cult center of Amun. And here is the capital. Every king he would like to record the name in the temple. So that's why it was Kabul, right? No temple. That's why it became mountains for building. The shrine was a shrine, the temple was in it. So that's why we used to have one huge tower in each temple. But in Karnak, how many towers we have? Ten different towers. From west to east, we have six. One, two, three, four, five, and then we have six. And from north to south, we have one, two, three, So we have two axes here. We not only one like some other temple. Each other. Correct? Then, the second two new towers, as you can see, the very good position, looks like that. It's totally destroyed. Only to give us a imagination of how it used to be. The ending patient, to the front of that stuff, and opening up a piece of the view from the security. So that's the reaction in here. And when Alexander came, he would like to be accepted by the Egyptians, so he added a small shrine in the sanctuary or in the holy place. Alright? So, but you can still see the same as well as plan. Indentation opening above each as well indentations to include flag stuff and as well to change the flag and we're going to see the remains of the huge hot brick wall which used to surround the temple and the two huge towers as you can see hide everything behind why because this is a secret place nobody is allowed to know what's going on inside and then you're going to see where we have some of the maps we are going to find the remains of a, a platform or a pier, right, which used to connect to the river Nile by a side canal. So we have the main stream, we have a side canal, and then the boats are reached to the far end, yes, of the valley, unload everything they need, building materials, colors, tools, etc., and then they are using that for construction. Then we are going to see ram headed sphinx for the first time to see the sphinx representing the body of a lion and head of a ram how many sphinxes we have seen so far we have seen in Edfu you remember yesterday a sphinx the body of a lion and head of a falcon right yes. he's a pyramid we have seen that you're gonna see as well we have a sphinx the body of a lion with a human head here you can see the head of a ram we still have two outside Egypt in Metropolitan Museum in the state we have a sphinx, the body of a lion and head of a monkey. In Holland, an ancient Egyptian statue, a sphinx, the body of a lion and head of crocodile. So we always got one body, the lion. But we may change heads. Why we change heads? To change different aspects attributed to one single god. I repeat and I insist. The ancient Egyptian religion, it was not polytheist, worshiping different gods and goddesses like it is written in different guidebooks. No. The ancient Egyptians, they believe in one single God.
But what about those birds, animals, reptiles? Those are nothing but aspects of one thing they die. They imagine that their God is as mighty as a lion, as intelligent as a man, as fertile as a ram, as lofty as a falcon, as wise as a monk, swims and dives like crocodile. You get my point? That this Hathor, for example, representing as a cow. Did the ancient Egyptian they worship the whole cows like in some countries? No. They only imagine that the God, he got as well, look after the child and as well like the cow, something like that. Right? So that's why you're going to find here the God, his name is Amun Ra, and from here another similarity between religion. Nowadays, right, we end our prayers regardless the language we speak, regardless the religion we practice by saying what? Amen. Amen. Alright, so that's why I always say the whole religion is nothing but branches of one tree. Right? Let's explore that. We're going to visit Luxor Temple. So it's 1.7 miles. Are we, we're not walking that whole way, are we? No, no. We're <laughs> going to use the bus. And then this is decreased by Sphinx Avenue. Alright? Mm. This is the River Nile. And uh, Friday, inshallah, we're going to visit the West Bank. Okay. Includes a lot of things. Mm. Yes, here. Yes, we are going to. Heard as a goose. And from here came the name of this temple. Did the ancient Egyptians they call it Karnak? They did not. They call it Ker in Nak, ancient Egyptian language. What does it mean? Ker in Nak, the place of the goose. Ker in Nak, corrupted to be Karnak nowadays. Right? Let's go to the shed. Wow. No problem, no problem. Okay, so okay. We'll, we'll share it. My bank, my bank account, I'm gonna give it to you. <laughs> give it your number and I'll, I'll throw it. <laughs> Alright, something very important now. Here, it is the indisputable proof. Now, our ancestors, they built those two huge towers without using scaffolding or how they built it. Here we have the remains mud bricks around. That's why you always say unfinished items. Very mm. important. Right? Because they never mentioned that. But why they never mentioned that? Because that was a certain job monopolized by a certain family. Alright? And they don't like this secret to be as well spread among the people. They are responsible for the royal construction. And most of them, they are the descendants from Imhotep. Imhotep, the genius engineer who first one used limestone as a building material. Anyway. Right. So, so this is sandstone. But in Giza, it is limestone. And the first use of limestone in Giza pyramids is in Saqqara. So that's why, have you been to Saqqara? State no. pyramids? No. no. If you look at even in different guidebooks, if you look at the pictures, the step pyramids, you're going to find the size of the blocks small and light. Why? Because he's still afraid using the stone as a building material, limestone. So that's why he made the size of the blocks small and light to look like mud bricks. Right? But in Giza pyramids, Giza pyramids it was built later than Saqqara, 180 years. So he trusted that the columns so that they can increase the size of the blocks. So that's why he increased the size of the blocks. In Giza pyramids, the size of the blocks big and heavy, right? But in Saqqara, small and large. And it's very important to go to Saqqara. Why? Because even if he, when he constructed the columns, he never left the columns standing like this. He supported the column by a wall. Well, they were built. Yes, the columns and is supported by a wall. Why? Because he's not trusted to use limestone as a building, but he's still afraid. So that's why Saqqara is very important. Because they are giving you the process, the mistakes happen till they reach to get the pyramid. It is the highlight. Alright? So, but the question is, how do they transport the big, heavy block of stone? Construction 
and they make the decoration from top to bottom. Alright? And then they level up the wall, they are adding mortar or plaster, and then they do bread, and then drawing freehand, and then come the supervisor to correct that by using black ink, and then carving two different styles of art, high relief or sunk relief, and the last stage, which is the cup. We were wondering, I don't know if you're part of the conversation, whether they use stencils. Yes. Actually, when you look at Valley of the Kings, especially at Valley of the Queens, you're going to find those hieroglyphics, birds, animals, etc. Those are almost identical. How? And those are made by different people. And even here in the temple, those are made by different people. But those are almost identical. Why? Because they use the stem template. And this is as well, we found that in Cairo Museum. We found as well some of the stencils they use as well to decorate the wall or the tombs. Right? So this is as well for the tower. But what about the pyramid? Here is the question. They use the same way to build the pyramid and what kind of ground? Let us suggest this is the base of the pyramid. Right? Yes, of uh, the festival. 
Because they left a mess in here. Yes, who are going to clean the temple? Nobody is allowed to stay. So we have some priests responsible for spiritual services and some other priests responsible for manual duties. So we have different categories, right? And I'd like you to imagine how big is the temple and try to give me a figure how many priests they are serving in here. Manual, spiritual service, right? And how many singers, suppliers, dancers, etc. But be careful, Karnak, it is not the temple which we are visiting. Karnak, it is a state within a state. Karnak, they own farm in Minya. They own farm in Delta. They own gold mines in Nubia. All of them, there are a lot of people they are working, consider Karnak employee, and they get paid by the authorities. Right? I imagine, I, I say that to imagine how powerful was the high priest of Karnak Temple and during ancient Egyptian time. Right? In New Kingdom Temple. The two huge towers, mm -hmm. open court, full of pillars and the sanctuary. Right? The most important things in here, the statue. I think this is the first statue we see together. Right? Yeah. You have seen a lot of statues, especially you, you have been in Cairo Museum. You are not yet. Right? Do you ask yourself why the ancient Egyptian made statues? Actually, ancient Egyptian, everything for a reason, not for granted. Death, according to the ancient Egyptian, considered nothing but temporarily departure. The body from the spirit. The body buried underground and the spirit ascend to heaven. Right? We believe that we are going to be resurrected, same body and same spirit. That's why they said we must preserve the body. What is the ancient Egyptian did to preserve the body? Mummification. Excellent. We would like to understand why they mummified the body. Simply to keep the body in a very good state to continue life beyond. But after they mummified the body, the mum, the mum is still fragile. Many of the mummies destroyed. They said, oh my goodness, those people are not going to be resurrected. Because the mummy, the, the body is gone. So they said we must find a solution. What was the solution? Statue. Right? So that's why the statue made out of stone. Right? So, but if I'd like to make a statue representing me, if I'd like to make a statue representing you, how can a different shape? Suppose we got twins. We would like to make one statue each. How can a different shape? Not by size, not by facial features, by names only. Right? So the name is important, the name is useful, the name is eternity. And because the name is eternity, when I don't like this king, I don't like him to be resurrected. I need him to destroy the whole statue. I just chisel his name, no more eternity. And that was the habit of King Ramses II. He used to chisel out the names of his ancestors to inscribe his name instead. <laughs> so that's why I personally call him the first chiseler <laughs> in history. <laughs> <All right? laughs> so, and he was afraid that maybe his successor are going to do the same. As you say in English, what goes around, <laughs> comes around. So that's why inside you're going to see he carved his name in an exaggerated degree. Uh. Cannot be chiseled <laughs> by his successor. This is as well what we can understand why inside some inscription deeper than the others. Right? You can see the king representing himself with oral features. Wearing the double crown, which looks like a champagne bottle in a bucket. And under that you can see the Nimeth, it is the royal headdress. And as well, uh, you're going to see a pleated is killed with a dagger on his waist. And then left leg forward. Left leg forward. Left leg forward, my friend. This is, we call it, living position. Why living position? Yes, because it's very strange coincidence that the whole armies all over the world, when they said to the soldiers, started to walk, how they started? He said, always left, right, left, right, all right? Uh, or some others, he said, maybe to keep the balance of the body. Why? Because he said the heart exists in the left side. They believe that the left side is heavier than the right one. So that's why how to keep the balance of the body, left, leg, forward. 99% of the statues representing you and me walking, left, leg, forward. But why is it 99%? Because we found one statue only, one, wow. in Cairo Museum, I hope you have seen it, 
in Cairo Museum represent, representing one of the high official right leg form. Some Egyptologists said, mistake. But some others said, no, it's not a mistake. Maybe it represents, look at this, in correct positioning of the heart. This disease, which is known nowadays as dextrocardia, when your heart existed in the right side. In that case, the right side heavier than the left one. So how can I keep the balance of that body right leg forward and the system is not lifted forward? Do you get my point? I do. Come on. Not all the iris in the <laughs> coffin. <laughs> all right. It's really <laughs> nooky. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to see some secret insignia in his hand, like the player. Le croissant. And Le like croissant that, we call it stick. Right? Like now, the people of the high rank, they have something that looks like a player. Yeah, to drive the flies. Uh -huh. which yeah. Is, uh, yeah, this is, it started in ancient Egypt, and you can see that as oh well yeah. in his uh, left hand. Right? Yes, left hand. And between his legs, you can see who is this statue first, sorry? He is King Ramses II. Right? And you're going to find the little statue belongs to his main wife, Queen Nefer. Mm -hmm. Titi. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Nefertiti came before Nefertiti, yeah, no. right? To avoid confusion, Nefertiti, 1400 years BC. Nefertari, 1300 years BC. Nefertiti, she was the wife of Akina. Nefertari, wife of King Ramses II. Oh, by the way, what is the difference of saying Nefertiti and Nefertari in the ancient Egyptian language? So the syllable Nefer in the ancient Egyptian language, it means beautiful. Nefertiti literally means the beautiful lady is coming. Nefertari, she said, the beautiful lady has come. <laughs> <laughs> lady is nature. All right? So this is the difference of saying Nefertiti and Nefertari. There is no such an honor gained to any wives of the Pharaoh along the ancient Egyptian history like Queen Nefertari. Right? Why? Because there is a temple built for her. Where? In Abu Simbel. 280 kilometers. We have great temple around this, And the small temple belongs to Queen Nefertari. But you should say, hey, Abdul, we have on the West Bank the temple of Queen Hatshepsut. But Hatshepsut, my friend, she was a ruler. She was a pharaoh. She was married. No, she was an actual ruler. Yeah, that's why she built a temple for her. But Nefertari, she never ruled. She just wife. Favorite wife. Favorite wife. All right. So that's why you're going to see the Fertari. There is no such an honor given to any wife of the Pharaoh along the history like her. Right? Please. In Egypt, and believe it or not, this black line was the level of the water. So from the Nile. From the Nile to here. Wow. Can you imagine? So this area used to be like a lake and leads, unfortunately, the destruction of the highlight of the temple, which is the Hall of Thrones. Right? Alright, now we are between the second two huge towers and the third two huge towers, the biggest single chamber in any ancient or modern monument so far. Right? So, we call it the Hall of Pillars, columns, and rock ceiling. You remember? Like yesterday in Italy. But the flood leads to the Columns start to collapse. When the columns collapse, what does it mean? The ceilings collapse. So the ceilings collapse. Yes. But when the water receded and they started as well to rebuild the columns, they found the columns it is not strong enough to put the ceiling up. So that's why they left the hall of pillars without seats. Right? So let us see how it looks like. Oh, see. Always in here, the source is leaving the gun. And then he's taking pictures. No, 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 no. Take your picture. But it is always like this. Because we're all just you can see. You can imagine how it looks like. But you can see the amount of hieroglyphics in here. What is it? The little room. So can you repeat that please for the video? I can. Assalamu alaikum. Like a shabha. 134. 134 columns. The double central columns are bigger than the rest. Wow. Alright? So you can see only the double central columns are bigger and the rest, those are short. The mm. difference in size between the double central columns and the short columns created something we call it nowadays clear story window. The only remains of the clear 
story. Windows is up there. You can see that? The rest is destroyed, as you can see. It's collapsed. Alright? So, I'd like you to imagine how it looks like. Room with many columns, rock ceiling. But the double central, they are bigger than the rest. When you're going to find the difference in level, we have the clear story windows to allow the light to penetrate. Like in cathedral, like in the mosque. So the, the sun can reach only the main axis, can reach only the big columns. But the short columns, they are always in darkness. Agree or disagree? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Again, the light only can penetrate through this one. This one is, is used to be between those two columns, used to have a roof, right? So the sun only can reach this columns and the other side, but not the short one. So that's why I look at the architectural elements in here. The double central columns only decorate the capital S open papyrus. Can you see that? The big columns only. But what about the short columns? The short columns, you can see the capital S closed papyrus capital. Why? Because papyrus cannot grow in darkness. Papyrus need light, need sun as well to grow. So that's why the architectural element in here is very precise. They haven't been in here. <laughs> the third one, I think they take some pictures in here and then they have the shots oh, okay. yeah, back home. Yeah, it's mostly CGI and yeah, computer yeah, I graphics. So. Okay, I think so. All right. So look at here. Can you see this cartouche? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right. Which one is included here in the name? The first name or coronation name? It's very easy to look here. You can see the sun disk and it goes. Yes. Uh -huh. So this is, as well, it goes without saying that this cartouche includes the birth name. How we pronounce that in the ancient Egyptian language? Sa, Sa, Ra. Sa, Ra. The son of the sun god Ra. Right? right? And then the name. How you can read it? You can see this symbol. It looks like an axe. This is, we call it Miri. Beloved. And this is God Amun. Sitting and the two high feather above his head. And then you can see the sun god Ra. Right? And this umbrella, we call it M. And this is Lenin, the phonetic value S, and this is the phonetic value W. How we can read that? Ra, Miss Su. Ra, Miss Su. Miri Emin. Ra, Miss Su. Ramses. Miri Emin, beloved of God Amun. Right? So that reading the, the cartouche is different from the text. Right? We read from the middle. Right and then left. Hmm. Right? Ah. Ra Misu yeah. Miri M. Ra Misu became Ramses. Miri M and beloved of God Amura. But what about that? See that? Yeah. This is we call it Misu BT. Right? It means who belongs to upper and lower east. And there's another title. Semicircle, we call it Neb, Lord. And then the two lands. The Lord of the two lands. Right? Mm. King of upper and lower east. And then you're going to see the name. Right in here. So Yes. But, but the goose and the sun are right on the other side of it. How yes, exactly. Yes, we can as well have this one, and this is the coronation name, and then birth name. Another coronation name, birth name. Reverse. Okay. All right? This is it's more clear. All right? It's still the coronation name. You can see the sun desk, we call it Ra. And yeah. the head of a jackal, we call it Usir. The lady sitting, the feather above her head, Gades Ma'id, goddess of justice and truth. Do you remember to wear the heart again as a feather? Final judgment, right? In the scale, right? Mm -hmm. So this is as from here came the scale of justice mm -hmm. all over the world. Yes, the lady blindfolded, mm -hmm. holding scale, ancient Egyptian, mm -hmm. right? And then you can see another sun desk. And this tool, we call it opening of the mouth ceremony. The new crowned king, they holding this tool from this side, and then they put this side in the mouth of his father, most probably, to open his mouth to take the power out of his mouth. Yeah. Symbolic. Opening of the mouth ceremony. Right? And then under that you can see water. It is a phonetic value of a letter. N. Right? How we read that? Usir Ma'it Ra Setib In Ra. Again. Usir Ma'it Ra Setib In Ra. Usir Ma'it Ra Setib In Ra. This is the coronation name of King Ramses II, mm. which became later on 
I think the British they know that. Ozzy Mandir. Do you remember this poem? It's a very famous poem in 1930, 1940. I am Uzi Mandir.